I ventured on my own pilgrimage to the Missionaries of Charity in Calcutta in early 1980. Who could fail to be touched by the work of the orphanage? Not I. Though I did find myself a little put off by the mission's motto, He that loveth correction, loveth knowledge. Bit of a workhouse ring to that, perhaps. But it was Mother Teresa herself who completed the wreckage of the effect. As we stood by the tiny cots, she turned and said, This is how we fight abortion and contraception in Calcutta. Now, it might be argued that a campaign against family planning is low on the list of Calcutta's many pressing needs. But as a leading member of the Pope's fundamentalist tendency on matters of sex and procreation, Mother Teresa has made this single issue into her global crusade. The greatest destroyer of peace today is the cry of the innocent unborn child. If a mother can murder her own child in her own womb, what is left for you and for me to kill each other? Tenderness about the unborn is an emotion that I share myself. But tenderness about the unborn also becomes an overtly political matter when it's preached by a presumable virgin who also campaigns against birth control. Let us promise Our Lady who loves Ireland so much that we will never allow in this country a single abortion. And no contraceptives. Mother Teresa has no politics, so she maintains, and so many people believe. But when she came to London in 1988, ostensibly as an advocate for the homeless, she bent the ear of the Iron Lady and sought to steer her to the support of a bill limiting abortion. The sponsors of that bill, who arranged the meeting, were in no doubt that her intervention was political. She's not a party political figure, but she's a political figure in the sense that, A, she is part of what may be called the uh, Catholic agenda, the Christian, broader Christian right agenda, and the Catholic Church has been following what has generally been considered a hard-line approach under the uh, present uh, Pope. And now, she's part of that agenda, and that is fairly political agenda. I mean, you know, uh, no abortion, uh, opposition to birth control, ideas like that are, are fairly, uh, you could say, they're, they're, they would be contested in the political arena. And the second factor is that she is also part, if you like, of the Western agenda, where the the West is still part of the third world. The rich world has a poor conscience. It wants, in fact it needs, to think that someone, somewhere, is doing something about the third world. And the Mother Teresa myth ministers to this desire. Here is a Western woman who has forsaken her life, albeit whatever life she might have had in Albania, um, you know, for, for sacrifice herself for the people of the third world. It makes the West feel better, you know. This is, this is one of us again, once again, rescuing the third world. Raising the room. Yes, yes. raising the room. He's got his rations. Yes, though. he's got it, he's cleaning it. Mm -hmm. And then pay to shop. In the subliminal appeal that she generates, there is something of the mission to the heathen, something of the old colonial outpost, and something of Florence Nightingale. While in the silent and abject demeanor of her patients, there is something of the deserving poor. The great white hope in this iconography takes on the big black hole. And the rewards are by no means all in heaven. For someone whose kingdom is not of this earth, Mother Teresa has an easy way with thrones, dominions and powers. Why do the rulers of this sinful and selfish world find her so awfully congenial? Is it because she returns the compliment? She may or may not comfort the afflicted, but she has certainly never been known to afflict the comfortable. Some people see her here, posing with Ron and Nancy. In the truest sense, citizens of the world. 
Mother Teresa is. The very hand that bestowed the Medal of Freedom on Mother Teresa armed and paid the death squads of Central America. Accepting the award with her customary modesty on behalf of all the world's poor, she croaked, I never realized that you loved the people so tenderly. I must say, I hadn't noticed that either. Reagan's proxies murdered, among many others, four American nuns and the Catholic Archbishop of San Salvador at the very moment that he was celebrating Mass. But, visiting the slaughterhouse states of the region during that period, Mother Teresa found nothing untoward. Everything was peaceful in the parts of the country we visited, she claimed, after touring the killing fields of Guatemala, adding for good measure, I do not get involved in that sort of politics. <laughs> In 1984, a ghastly chemical spill from the Union Carbide plant in the Indian town of Bhopal took two and a half thousand lives and poisoned thousands more. This was an act not of God, but of a negligent multinational corporation. Mother Teresa's advice to the angry victims? Forgive. Forgive. What Mother Teresa has done is she has accepted implicitly the idea that there's nothing much you can do for the poor except take them off the streets and, you know, look after them. You cannot change their attitudes. You cannot make them feel that they have an ability, they may even have the means to improve and change their lives. She, she's not bothered with that agenda. She's only bothered with the agenda of trying to rescue their souls and make them a bit better before, before they go on to the eternal life, which is a very um, understandable, but in fact a very old-fashioned Christian idea. It is not a question of saying, how can we tackle the real problems of poverty? Like most people who claim to be apolitical, Mother Teresa is in practice and in theory an ally of the status quo, and when the status quo is threatened, a trusted ally of the conservative forces. This places her in bold contrast to those, even among the religious, who have rejected the fatalistic and submissive conclusions about poverty that are promulgated by Catholic traditionalists like her. <laughs> 